morning, just to let you guys know, um, things are okay. You know, the, the, the church body's okay. Uh, our church family's okay. The direction we're heading is actually really healthy and really good. Um, this last week, I was able to meet with Lance Williams, who is our uh, executive director and our financial trustee, and also with Bob Peoples, who is our facilities trustee. And, uh, and just so that you guys know, we've been now going through the process of separating our two campuses into two separate churches, which was the end goal for this August. We were heading that direction, um, but it got sped up because of some of those decisions that were being made while I was gone. Um, and with that, we're recreating a budget for us as a church so that we can live within our means and create a budget that actually fits what is coming in, just like you do at home. You know, If income drops at home, your spending should drop at home, right? Same thing here at church. And so we're working on that, and, and we have a pretty a conservative budget that we are going to be sharing with you guys, with the partners and givers uh, here at Westwood um, Church, and and uh, and so be looking forward to that within you know the next week. Uh, we'll send that out to you guys. And this season of our church family, there's kind of three things I, I want us to focus on, and it's kind of this illustration of a house. When we think about a house. A house has a front door, and then it has the insides of the house, the rooms, and then it has a back door. And our goal for this summer is for us to first strengthen the house. Let's strengthen the things inside of our church that will help us be healthy and get healthy. And part of that is is eldership and biblical eldership and what that means and looks like. And we're talking about the five-fold ministry that God put in place for the spiritual leaders of the church body. And and, uh, and I'm going to be presenting that in August when I come back um, after vacation and things. And as we move forward as a church to bring those things healthy financially inside the house. We want to strengthen the house and be wise. Um, and, and so we're going to be doing those things to strengthen the house through the summer. And uh, we want to close the back door in our church family. And closing the back door means helping people connect into the body, connect relationally, get plugged into small groups, going through the things that we have put in place like New to New Hope and Growth Track and um, Starting Point and continue to move those things forward so people get plugged into relationships. Because honestly, if church, if all you do is come, experience, and go, all you're experiencing is just a, a, a gathering. That's all you're doing. We want you to experience relationship. We want you to get in smaller circles. And it's been cool to hear some of the groups that got started here in the spring, just how those relationships have already deepened. Um, and I've heard some really cool stuff. That's where like church community and body really gets experienced. And then when we go to the fall, we want to open the front door, which means we want to open our church and let people know, hey, we exist. Here's why we're here. Um, because there are 78,000 people in Wayne County that don't attend church. That means we have a lot of work to do to reach those people and to open our doors to say, hey guys, we're here for people who may have thought about God but didn't feel a safe place to experience him or learn about him. That's our heartbeat. That's our mission, to help those who are broken find wholeness in Christ. And we're going to continue in that focus and that mission. Um, so, so I just wanted to share that real quickly, let you guys know. That's our heart. The vision of the church hasn't changed. We're, we're focusing on the things to get healthy and for us to move forward. So if you have questions, again, you can always email me, ask me questions. Um, I'll, I'll be an open book um, and, and, and share that with you. But this morning, we're going to continue on in this series called The Fight. You know, that's why we have this, this boxing, you know, scene up here. We've got the ring and, you know, we've got the boxing gloves. And um, I thought it'd be cool if we actually had a fight. You know, like let's, has anybody ever boxed? I know anybody is a boxer back there you do wow okay so just you know i've never boxed so i would if i went in the ring um it would be a quick fight i'd be down pretty quick because i'd be running around in circles i'd be the the little guy that wants to run around and not get hit you know um tire the other person out and then finally hit them once and they'll go down that would be my dream boxing story um but we're talking this morning and we're digging into the story of samson which is a pretty familiar story right we've heard about samson samson is a big strong guy but there was an issue with Samson. Samson was an angry dude, a really angry dude. Now, I want to illustrate this. We're talking about anger management this morning in this fight series, because whenever there's a fight, there's usually anger attached to that fight, right? There's usually like that emotion that bubbles up like, ah, you know? Um, and so I need, I need three people. I need, I need two people up here on stage with me here for a second. Um, and then I need one person who wears glasses. Who, who wears glasses? <laughs> Oh, somebody's taking off glasses. Okay, one of you guys back there with glasses. I don't care. You guys wrestle. The other one can come up. All right, stop right there. Thank you. I need two more people up here with me to help me out with something. Um, no, really. I need two people. Mitch, come on up. and uh, Yeah, you can come on up. 
you're getting shot at, my friend. Have, has anybody, just a show of hands, has anybody ever played Angry Birds? Just, just to show your hands, do you guys know what Angry Birds is and, and what the game is? Um, I, I need you guys to stand right up here on either side of this top stage. Go ahead and stand up here. Yeah, come on up, Mitch. You can come stand up here. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for moving. I need you to put that pig on your head, okay? So here's the thing. Angry Birds, the whole premise of this Angry Birds game, you can hold that side for me. I know it's not. I'm sorry. My kids had two Angry Birds and the pig got chewed by the dog. So we have... So we have a Minecraft pig, all right? So it's still in the gaming world, all right? So, um, so like the whole thing with the Angry Birds game, the whole premise is, you know, the birds have eggs and the pigs came and stole the eggs and now the birds are ticked off, right? We had something that belonged to us. Those guys took it and now we're gonna just wreak havoc and shoot ourselves into their building and, and try and kill them, right? Like that's the whole premise of this whole game, Angry Birds. And so you got your glasses on, right? You can protect yourself if you want to, but... Oh, okay. Was that really low? Yeah. Do I need more power? Okay. I need to get behind the TV. There we go. Okay. So, like, the whole idea is that these birds are ticked off, and they're like, these pigs, you know, we want revenge, and that went really high. All right, toss the red one back, because I at least have to hit him, if not the pig, right? So, um, good throw. So, like, the whole premise is that these birds, right, what do they want? What's, what's the word that they want? Revenge, right? That's what they want. Injustice has been had against us, and so we're just angry, and we're ticked off. And I'll be honest with you, like, this was one of the first, like, crazy games. Oh, that went to the right. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, should I try one more time? I'm wasting time, but it's okay. I'll try one more time. The relevance of the glasses is because I didn't want him to get hit in the, in the eyeball. Not that I thought my accuracy was going to be that fantastic or anything, but, but like, all right. At least I hit, oh, the bird's gone. We knocked the bird down. The pig is off his high horse. All right, you guys are going to throw those back to me whenever you get a chance. But, but here, the whole premise is, right, these birds are just ticked off and angry. And well, I didn't even see what happened. Something. Oh, it did? Good throw. Uh, the, the whole, so the whole premise is that these birds are ticked off. They're angry. They want revenge. And let me ask a question. Have you ever been so angry that you wanted justice and revenge? So now it gets quiet, right? It's like, have you ever had that experience? Somebody stole my eggs, and I'm just angry, and I want to get them. That's happened in our life. Whether it's been any, any siblings in the room? Anybody have, like, brothers or sisters? Yeah, if you've had brothers or sisters, you've wanted revenge. Like, it's just a part of life, you know? Like, your brother or sister's done something to you. Is anybody married in, in the room? Just show of hands. Are those of you who are married? Have you ever been angry at your spouse for any reason whatsoever? This morning, on your way here, right? Like, like it's natural. Two sinners together equals conflict. And conflict raises up this emotion of anger. And the problem is anger can be so misused. Or it can be used for good. Anger is simply neutral. It's an emotion. And we all have emotions. And if I ask you the question, can you control your emotions? If you can, let me know, because you're brilliant. It it probably means if you feel like you can, you're stuffing all your emotions down. And someday they're going to come out. It's going to be like quite a scene. Somebody record that, you know? When we look at this story and we dig into the story of Samson, we see that same heart. See, Samson was a guy that was called by God. He was actually a judge. And if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn with me to Judges chapter 15, okay? Judges chapter 15, it's the Old Testament, kind of near the beginning of the Old Testament. Um, And uh, and I'm going to read from chapter 13 first, but we'll spend a, a good chunk in chapter 15 to understand Samson's story. See, Samson was chosen by God. He was actually brought to this planet through a miraculous birth because his mom and dad could not have kids she was barren they couldn't have kids and then an angel shows up and says god has picked you and you're going to have a a son is and he's going to be a nazarite which means somebody who is chosen by god for a special purpose set apart and that's what happened they had a son his name was samson and samson as a nazarite was given incredible insane strength and labeled a judge for Israel. 
In this season that we look at the Israelites, and, and we talk about this all the time, what we see is this continual cycle from the Israelites in relationship to their God that goes through this cycle of, yay, we're with God, we love God, to we're going to disobey God, now we're going to go on our own. And then God sends them into a, a season of distress or he allows somebody to come in and have victory over them or they are now ruled over by somebody and then they go, oh no, and they repent and they come back to God. We see this cycle over and over. In Judges 13, we see this. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So it's not that they were just not good. They were actually doing evil in God's sight. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. So the Israelites, you're supposed to be free and have a strong relationship with God, completely evil, going, going completely against him. And so he's like, all right, Philistines, take over the land. My, my people are going to be under your authority, under your rule. And so the Philistines started taking over land. They were actually like a, a pretty powerful nation, these Philistines. And, and the Israelites were okay with it. Like when we see the story, like the Israelites were like, oh, well, you know, it's fine. And they just kept doing their evil and doing, just living life. And, and so the Philistines came in and just crept in and, and the, the Israelites didn't see an issue with it. So God was like, I got to send somebody. I'm going to send Samson to deal with these Philistines so the Israelites can realize how bad they are and that this isn't my plan for them. And that's what he did. He sent Samson into the story. So what does it mean to be a Nazarite? <clears throat> well, a, a Nazarite had a certain vow that they, that they would make before God to be set apart. And those vows were certain things they couldn't do or certain things they had to represent their vow and promise to God for the calling he put on their life. And a Nazarite, there were three key things. One was the Nazarite was never supposed to eat of any grapes or like drink wine or anything that had to do with grapes. So no peanut butter and jelly for Samson, right? Poor guy. Um, the other thing was uh, they weren't supposed to touch anything dead. If it was dead, it was unclean for the Israelites and it was unholy. And so a Nazarite was never to touch an animal that was dead, anything that was dead. And then the third thing, which is the interesting thing, and we all kind of know the story about Samson, a Nazarite was never to cut their hair. So they're supposed to look like, you know, long-haired hippies, you know? That's, that set them apart. Everybody saw Samson with long hair and understood he is a Nazarite. Physically, he made a vow, and we can see it. His hair is just long. And I don't know if he braided it. I don't know if, it, you know, if he had dreadlocks. I don't know, right? So, like, but his hair was long. The thing that we'll see through the story of Samson over these next three weeks, we're going to dig into his story, is that he breaks all three of those vows. Samson actually makes choices against God and God's call and plan for his life. And we're going to see that internal fight with Samson. And we're going to see at the end, if you know the story, there's, there's a victory at the end, but it's not pretty. And I don't think it was the original intent of God for Samson. Samson made choices. You know that whatever choice we make, there's always going to be consequences. But in the end, God's promises will always come through. Always. God doesn't, ne he never gives up on his promises. And that's, that's what we see in the story of Samson. So we're jumping in the story right now where, where Samson's young. He's, I don't know, he's like 20 something. And, uh, and he's strong. Everybody knows he's like the strongest guy around. And so people are a little afraid of him because he, he has power and strength and, and position because he's like chosen by God and everybody sees it, that he's a Nazarite. And he goes to his parents after seeing this woman and saying, wow, I want her, I want her. And so he went to his parents and said, hey, mom and dad, can you go over and get this woman because I want to marry her? Now, just so you know, that was not what happened in the culture in those days. It was the mom and dad that picked the wife for the son and they would go find and they would arrange it and so the Samson coming and being like, I want to pick my own woman, already kind of bubbles up and shows a little pride, you know, a little like, I am the man, look at me, you know, what woman want and want this, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing we see with Samson, you know, that attitude, that pride, that kind of like, I, I'm, I'm all that. And so we get into that story in chapter 14, and, and they, they arrange it, and they get married, but the thing is, the woman that he married was a Philistine. She wasn't a Jew. She wasn't part of the Israel, Israelite nation. And so he picked somebody who he was actually supposed to be against in the Philistine nation. She must have been really good looking, right? We'll see later on, and next Sunday, um, you're going to hear more about, like, 
Samson's eyes and how they drew to, to women and, and, and that fight that he had with that. But, um, but in this process, they had a big party, they had a wedding, they got married, and, and in the party, it lasts for like a week because they would like, a wedding wasn't just a day, an evening, yahoo, and it's done. It was like a week-long celebration and, and people were hanging out and, and Samson made this bet with, with the, uh, the Philistine men that were around, said, hey, if you can figure out my riddle, um, you guys, I'll give you, you know, clothes and, and stuff. And, and he made a bet against them figuring out this riddle. And, uh, and then they said, but if you guys figure it out, then I'll have to give you guys clothes. And, by, you know, it's like this whole thing. And, uh, and so the, all the Philistines start going to his now wife and says, like, you know, tell us what the riddle means. We don't understand it. And, and finally, she gets it out of him, what the riddle means. And they come and say, hey, we figured it out. And, uh, and he comes, and he, now Samson's ticked off because his wife betrayed him. His new wife betrayed him, shared what the riddle answer was. They came. He lost the bet. In anger, he went to another town, stole a bunch of clothes and a bunch of stuff, to pay off his debt for this bet and brought it back to this Philistine party and said, fine, here you go. I'm just ticked off now. And he left. He left town. And he left his wife with his father-in-law and disappeared. Now we get into chapter 15. And this is where we jump into the story because now, I don't know what happens. Samson's like, oh yeah, I have a wife. And he wants to visit her, right? So like, so he does what all good, you know, Israelite men do. Grabs a small goat as an offering, you know, and then goes to check out his wife again, back where she was. All right, so you guys with me? So we're in 15, chapter 15. You can read along in your Bibles. We'll go verses 1 through 8, and we're going to see how this anger thing starts being lived out with Samson. All right, so if you're with me, say, yep. Yep. All right, verse 1. Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. Uh Uh-oh. Trouble's about to happen, right? Something's about to go down. I brought a goat. I can see my wife, you know. I want to go into her room. And, uh, And the father's like, no, can't do that. I was so sure that you hated her. Why? Because he left. He said that I gave her to your companion. What? He's like, what? Samson, you left and we're all ticked off. And so I figured you didn't want her and uh, we thought this wasn't a real deal. So I gave my, my daughter to one of the other guys to marry or to be with. Oh. And then he like tries to like, you know, say, but, but isn't her younger daughter, isn't she even more attractive? Take her instead. It's like, you brought a goat, you can have my younger daughter, you know? Okay. I'm glad these things don't happen today, Right? But this is Samson's world. This is what he's, you know, processing in this moment. Let's see what Samson does. So Samson said to them, This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he is ticked off about all this. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs, like you do. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails. What just happened, right? Did this just not escalate? It's like, what, what, what are you doing, Samson? Like, this shows just the craziness of Samson in this story. What kind of planning would it take to go out, find 300 foxes, and then the process of tying their tails together, all 300 of them, and then lighting a torch in their tails? This guy was determined for revenge, right? This wasn't like a, I'm angry and just kind of do something stupid right now and I'm going to leave. Like, oh no, he said, now I have a right to get even. Watch me. That's how angry Samsa was. Fox's tails lit on fire. What happens next? He lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. This is a big deal. Like, this is the livelihood of the Philistines. Their, their grains, their shocks, their fields. Like, this is no small thing, what Samson just did. He's like, you all, I have, an, I have the right now because I'm ticked off at you Philistines. I'm burning down all your stuff. I'm burning down all your grains. 
revenge. Anger and revenge. I have a right. Let's keep reading. And when the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went and they forgave him and said, I'm sorry. That's not what happens. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Whoa! Hold on a minute. This is gruesome. Just, you know, if the Bible, if the Old Testament was actually a movie, it would be rated R. Like, there's some nasty stuff in there. Like, this is like, what just happened? So Samson went and burned their fields, and then the Philistines were ticked off because the father-in-law gave away his wife to somebody else. Let's go get them. It's their fault. Now, what happens after that? Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, now he's pointing his finger back at the Philistines, since you did that, I swear that I won't, won't stop until I get my, say this word with me, revenge on you. And he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. That is a nasty word. Sla- slaughter. Oh my gosh. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Edom. Now we're going to stop there in the story. Okay. What the heck is happening? I, have, has, have any of you ever been mad at your in-laws? Have any of you then take foxes and burn down their house? Anybody? Right? Like, like this is like ridiculous anger. You, you see this guy, Samson, who is strong as all get out. So strong that now when people were coming to attack him, he just slaughters them. He, he beats them up. They're done. Nobody could win a fight against Samson because of his strength and what he had. But the whole thing we see continually over and over and over in Samson's story is revenge. Anger boiled up to, I now have a right for my justice, and I'm going to live it out on you. Watch yourself, right? That's, that's Samson's story. Now, we're in this series. We're talking about the fight, and, and with fighting, whether it's, it's in a marriage, whether it's sibling to sibling, whether it's friend to friend, anger will be a natural emotion that comes up. What you do and how you handle it matters, right? And this morning, I just want to teach you two quick things. And I want to teach you the two types of anger and the two types of responses we can have to anger. One is like Samson, and one is actually like Jesus. Jesus got angry. I don't know if you knew that. We'll get there in a minute. Samson got angry. Both of them got angry. One did it rightly, one did it wrongly. And so let's look at these two types. If you've got notes, I would always encourage you, write your notes down. Uh, you know, write these things down because the tip of your pen is usually sharper than your mind at times and it helps you remember. It helps you remember the things that we learn here on Sundays. And, and, uh, and so I want to teach us just really quickly and really briefly these two types of anger because the first one we see is the kind of anger that we see in Samson this sinful anger, which, which that kind of anger is self-seeking and prideful. It's anger that bubbles up and wants to protect or seek justice for ourselves. Somebody did something against me, and now I'm going to be like, ah. And so I need revenge. I need to seek justice for myself. That's this sinful, self-seeking, prideful anger that can bubble up in situations and in relationships. Uh, I, I want us to look at James chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. And some of these, you can just write down the reference to these verses and go back and read them, or if you want to follow along in your Bibles, you can too. James has, uh, uh, gives us this picture of anger and, and, and that desire and that emotion that bubbles up inside. And I think he, I think he captures what happens to us. This is what he says in James 4, 1 and 2. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Right? That was what Samson was doing. His, his, his fight, his quarrel, his anger came up from a desire that was battling inside of him. And then it says this in verse 2. It says, you want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. And he says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Now that last part kind of changes the story a little bit, right? Because 
it turns our focus to God, not ourselves. Whenever we're desiring things for ourselves, whenever we're in a situation where I didn't get what I wanted or I got what I didn't want, that's when anger starts to rise inside of us. That desire inside of us brings up this attitude of quarrel and anger. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Um, Because our anger, I believe, is largely based on our desires, just like James said. And I think it's based around these two questions. What did I want that I didn't get? Or what did I get that I didn't want? Does that make sense? When you think about your relationship, I'm going to go to marriages here for a moment. Like when you have an argument in your marriage, in your relationship, and something bubbles up with you in anger, is it typically because of one of those two things? Either I got something from you that I didn't want, and now I'm angry, or or I wanted something from you, but I didn't get it, and now I'm angry, and I'm going to have a little fight with you about that, right? It's these desires inside of us that bubble up. And, and when we respond with sinful anger, all we're trying to get is justice and revenge for ourselves from the other person. I want you to tell me I'm right and you're wrong, right? I want, I want to see my justice because you did something wrong, and boy... I hope your coffee's cold at Starbucks, you know, right? Like, or I, I, I hope you get a bad grade at school because I didn't like the way you treated me that way. Or, or I hope you get found out and somebody says something really bad to you or punishes you. Or like we, this inner dialogue of self-seeking anger will only produce more self-seeking anger. I'm going to give you a solution to that at the end, okay, in a moment. This is what we see in Samson, in Samson's story. What did I want that I didn't get? I wanted my wife, and I didn't get her, and now I'm ticked off. So I'm burning down your fields, right? And then they killed, the Philistines killed his father-in-law and his wife. What did I get that I didn't want? You killed, you killed my wife and my father-in-law, and now I have a right to get even, right? Like, that's that sinful anger. Now let's flip the page here. Because there is another side to anger, and I, and I call it righteous anger. Righteous anger. So write, write that down. The first one is sinful anger, self-seeking, those kind of things. The second one is righteous anger, which is selfless. It's right, and it's true. It's based upon something that is real, that is right, that is just, and it raises something up actually in us of anger that can produce something good. Um, think about this with Jesus and I had a couple of different passages and I I just wanted to focus on one with Jesus because in in Mark chapter 11 we see this scene where Jesus gets angry I mean he's just ticked off and he enters into the into the temple and uh, all these people are selling stuff and they're and he's just like what the heck is happening this is not what's supposed to be happening inside of my house and God's house and he just flips out right before that um Right before this happens, in this passage, we see Jesus in the morning. He's actually walking towards the city, and, and, and he's about to go into the temple and do all these things. As he's walking, he's hungry, and he sees a fig tree. And he's like, okay, cool, I'm going to grab some figs on the way. So it's like for him, it's a snack pack while he, for breakfast as he's heading towards his next thing that he's going to be doing. As he goes to the fig tree, the fig tree has no figs on it whatsoever. And he gets hangry. Anybody ever been hangry? Some of you right now, maybe you skip breakfast to get here on time, right? Like, so like, so like go back and read, read this. It's so funny because he then looks at th- this tree and he says, cursed are you tree. You will never give figs to anybody ever again. He curses the tree because he didn't have breakfast, you know? So he's angry about food. Has anybody, you know, I'm like, cool. Jesus was real. You know, he <laughs> like, he had real emotions, real responses um, to the physical things that he was experiencing. And then the next scene is now he's in the temple and he shows up to the temple and he sees all these money changers in the temple. He's already hangry and now that hunger hasn't been subsided and now he's seen something that makes him really angry. I'm just playing with you, but that makes him really angry as he goes into the temple and he sees something that shouldn't be happening and he flips out. One of the the gospels says that Jesus went and found like stuff and fastened a whip Oh, that's so cool. That's like Indiana Jones, man. Like Jesus was a man's man, just so you know. He was not a wuss. He he was a man's man. He fastens a whip. 
he goes in, storms into the temple, and let's see what happens, all right, in this, in this passage. In Mark chapter 11, 15, 17, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Sounds like a madman, right? Ah, oh, man, I wish we had a YouTube video of this. Like, Jesus, like, flipping stuff off and with a whip, or psh, you know, like, yeah. He's like, manly Jesus, he is angry. Did Jesus ever sin? Yes or no? No. He didn't. This isn't a scene of Jesus sinning. This is a scene of righteous anger. He's angry about something that is right and true. And then this is, let's just keep reading. And he would, he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them now, he stops. He's like, guys, this is, this is not good. He said, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. Now he's letting them have it. It's like, I am righteously angry because this, he's like, this temple, this house was supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Do you hear what made Jesus angry? It's because the house wasn't in prayer. The house was in profit. That's righteous anger. Righteous anger is him saying, this does not look like my father. This does not look like God's kingdom. This does not, and I am angry because this is supposed to be a house of prayer and it's not, you all change it, right? Righteous anger comes about when something is against the kingdom of heaven and against God himself and against his truth. You can be righteously angry about things in your life. And you can choose to respond in one of two ways. Your own justice, right? That selfish kind of thing, that pride that comes in. Or you can choose to use that anger to fix the problem, to teach the people, to change the culture. That's what Jesus was doing in this scene and in this moment. Here's what I want you to understand about anger, okay? This is something that I've taught a long time and through biblical counseling that, that Nikki and I have been through every single marriage counseling we use this when it comes to um, communication like how to communicate you're going to be angry but anger is energy it is the way you use it will either show it as healthy or unhealthy as sinful or righteous but anger is energy and it should be used to attack the problem not the person whenever you use that anger that thing that's like this isn't right this injustice or this situation or we use this a lot in marriages because you're going to be angry with the person you live with. It's just reality. Two sinners in the same house. Whenever you can find out in your marriage, your relationship, that if you're angry about something, instead of using that anger just to be like, cha, 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 right? Like to get ammunition against them. Instead, you say, what is the actual problem here? Because it's not you. It's not me. There's a situation we need to fix and use that energy and the anger to fix the problem, to be mad at the problem to be righteously angry to fix the problem. That's when it becomes healthy. That's when it becomes good and fruitful and we see change from it. And so let me ask you this question. Is there something in your life, just like Jesus when he showed up and said, this isn't right, that produces in you a righteous anger? Something around you that you see that's like, this it doesn't look like the kingdom of heaven. I mean, are, maybe you're angry like Jesus and be like our church doesn't pray enough and the house of God should look more like a praying house does that righteously just burn something in you and want to change that it does for me I want to see our church be a church a prayer for all the nations we're going to learn about that in the weeks to come and we're going to push into that maybe it's seeing homeless you see somebody homeless and there's something that rises up in you it's like that's not right and you get a little mad about it use that to make a difference, right? Or, or whether it's seeing kids that get hurt in relationships or 
and families or whether it's poverty or sex trafficking or maybe you see persecuted Christians and that rises something up in you that you're like, ah, I need to do something about this or social injustices or, or maybe you see greed in the culture and consumerism and that gives you this just righteous anger like, man, I want to push against that. That's what righteous anger is. And the question is, is there something that you're righteously angry about that you can help change and bring change to? Righteous anger brings change, healthy change, right change, energy used to attack that problem, not the person or the people around you. Because I, I, the thing, uh, man, drives me nuts about the church in America is that the church in America so often, Christians see an injustice in our nation that looks like it pushes against Christianity and they raise up to fight people in that process, Right? you're against me, that group of people is against me, I'm going to fight against them instead of I'm going to fight for the thing I believe in, not against the people who believe against me. Does that make sense? There's a difference in that and what rises up inside of us. And so as we think about the fight, as we think about what it looks like to fight in right ways, let's check our hearts, okay? Let's check our hearts. I want to give us some time to do that. So God, I pray whatever it is that's, you know, that's in us. If there is anger that is kind of self-seeking, um, um, if there's anger, God, that is unrighteous, that is attacking other people and against other people, expose that in us right now because that root will dig deep into revenge and personal justice and we don't want to be like Samson we know that you're going to live out your promises in our life but God I don't want the consequences that Samson had because of his unrighteous anger so right now in us I pray that you would lead us just expose our hearts to ourselves God that um, that we'd allow you to speak Holy Spirit into us I, I have two challenges this morning and uh, the first one is this if there's something that you have in your life that is righteous anger fan that flame like dig deeper into that thing whatever that thing is that God kind of put in you it's those things in our life or our culture that makes God angry that he sees it's like that doesn't look like me that doesn't look like my kingdom um, fan that so that you can be a part of the change in it okay but if there's unrighteous if there's sinful anger that you're wrestling with I just had a few fill in the blanks to help you process this, okay? Because <clears throat> if there's anything I want to be, it's practical. And so maybe this will help you mine out what that unrighteous or that sinful anger might be. If you fill in the blank with these questions, I must have blank to live a meaningful life. Or what I think I need or desperately want is blank. Blank. Or you must give me blank or I'll be angry. Like, what is that thing in a relationship? If only blank would change, I would then be satisfied. Whatever you fill in the blank there with just might be the thing that is holding you in a state of personal sinful anger that isn't right, that you've been seeking justice for, or you've been putting conditions in your relationships with people. I don't know what those are. But if that's where you're at, let God work on that this morning. Let God work in those areas this morning. We're going to take a moment as a church family and, um, and kind of change our focus and our attention because when we're thinking about those things, we need to understand that we can experience forgiveness for all those things through Christ. He's already offered it, right? Like his forgiveness is perfect. It's complete. He, he, 
his act on the cross, his sacrifice for us, brought forgiveness into our life. But then he gives a continual invitation, if there's still sin, if there's something we're sinning in, that when we confess it, when we repent of it and bring it to him, he will always forgive it. But we also have to do that process of saying, God, I've, there's, there's anger in there that I need forgiveness for, I need to be set free from, and you can offer that to him. Or maybe it's another sin issue. I don't, I don't know what's going on in your life. Just when we respond, it's a time for God to do whatever he wants to do in us. And this morning, we're, we're going to remember what Christ did for us through communion. Now, communion is for those of you who are Christ followers. You've already committed your life to Christ. You've invited him in your life. And this morning, if you have...